Yes. Well, hi everyone, and welcome back to the Pushing the Limits. This is Lisa Tamati here, and today I am absolutely jumping out of my skin from excitement because I have Dr. Thomas Levy, who is one of the world's most renowned researchers and doctors in vitamin C, among a whole lot of other things. Dr. Levy is also a board-certified cardiologist and a lawyer to boot. Um, go figure that one out. Um, but Dr. <laughs> Dr. Levy is sitting in Miami. And he has given up a, a, an hour of his time today to, to share information that I think is absolutely crucial that you guys pay attention. So whatever you're doing, drop it and listen to this interview because the work that Dr. Levy and many of his colleagues have been doing is uh, been 40 years in the making. And we're going to be talking today about vitamin C. Now, recently I had Dr. Ron Hunninghake from the Reardon Institute on the show and you had an, uh, a great, we had a great interview and now we're going to continue that conversation with Dr. Levy uh, with his experience. So welcome to the show, Dr. Levy. It's fantastic to have you. Thank you, Lisa. Glad to be here. <laughs> so doctor, can you tell us a little bit, just in brief, your background and your journey towards vitamin C? Hmm. Well, in a nutshell, I was a garden variety mainstream cardiologist some 25 years ago and through a bunch of circumstances that I won't go into it's I don't know call it karma or destiny or something like that at the same time I decided to wind down my cardiology practice I met Dr. Hal Huggins in Colorado Springs Colorado mm -hmm. Dr. Huggins in my opinion was the first and the world's leading biological dentist he just wasn't a tooth mechanic, he took care of the whole body while addressing what was going on in the mouth. And anyway, to make a long story short, he, he ended up asking me to do medical consultations with his patients and follow them up long term. But that only occurred after I visited his clinic a few times and I saw things that, well, in med school you're taught don't exist. <laughs> As a as an intern and resident in internal medicine, you're taught these responses can't take place. Wow. And in addition to seeing just overall dramatic improvement in patients, uh, and I'm not going to say this is routine, don't get me wrong, but I saw uh, a couple patients that had been wheelchair bound with MS for over a year, and they took a few steps at the end of two weeks. I wow. mean, so there was clear stuff going on physiologically. But the thing that really hooked me was one day early on, uh, he had this very elderly patient, uh, an advanced neurologic disease. He was getting a ton of dental work, extractions. I mean, the type of stuff that puts uh, a college kid in bed for a week when he yeah. goes and gets his wisdom teeth yanked out. He just goes, oh, I got a yeah. rest. Well, at the end of several hours of this work, this woman was energetic like I couldn't believe. And I said, wow. something's wrong here. Something, <laughs> I said, Hal, what's going on? And if you knew Hal, you'd know Hal was a very dry, sarcastic person. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it, incidentally. <laughs> and he just pointed at the IV. I said, okay, yeah, that's an IV, Hal, thanks. He said, he says, but what's the big, what does that have to do? He said, it's what's in it. Okay, okay, Hal, what's in it? And he said, 50 grams of vitamin C. Wow, 50 grams. Back there. And that just came from left field, smacked me between the eyes, and I literally figuratively went rolling across the room. <laughs> and uh, as the expression goes, uh, I, I was going to believe, my, I wasn't going to be uh, misled by my lion eyes. <laughs> I saw something, it happened. <laughs> Something was going on here, and at that point in time, that began my research with vitamin C and just about everything else. Wow, so that's the story, and, and this is coming from dentists. So Dr. Hal uh, Higgins, Higgins was, was uh, very, very famous for making us aware of amalgam fillings, from what I understand, and um, uh, root canals. Um, root canals I need to yes. go back and uh, read his books after 
discovering that in one of your lectures and thinking, crikey, I've got a heck of a lot of those. Um, so I need to look into those for myself. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so they've got me a bit worried. I've already spent a bloody fortune on this. So I don't know. Um, but th so this is a very, I mean, you, you've come from cardiology and internal medicine into this. And then, and then you went and did a, a law degree. Um, just to add to the to the uh, achievements that you've had, and then and I might add, Dr. Hoggins taught me more real medicine than I'd ever learned before. So my really my second medical education was the one that counted. Wow, and so this is really important. So because people, I think uh, Dr. Lee, when we were you know talking previously, a lot a lot of um, just just people listening, when you go to your doctor, they are not God and they don't know everything on the planet. And what, what, what I try to advocate, and I'm not saying that, that your doctor's bad or, or, or whatever, but what I am saying is take responsibility for your own health and understand that we are all humans and that one person's education may not have included some of the things that are happening now. You know, so well, along those lines, I like to tell people that just as you pretty much said, you have to take responsible for, so responsibility for your health and you need to understand and you need to proceed at your comfort level, which means if you have a doctor, he or she, who is put off or doesn't want to take the time or is irritated by you asking questions, don't walk out of that office, run out of it. Okay, <laughs> so you need to find physicians, medical care, that are, will work with you. Uh, and as we all know, I mean, hey, physicians like to believe they're brilliant, but it's mostly in their head. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, they spend their time, they do their, they do their uh, time in school, but in my humble opinion, and I know this is somewhat snide and sarcastic, but I gotta say it anyway, I, my find that most physicians view getting a medical degree as the validation that they no longer need to think the rest of their lives. <laughs> wow. I'm a doctor now, I don't need to do anything else. Okay, that's and that's obviously only the beginning. And you should be continuing to learn and realize that you made a lot of, a lot of mistakes until the day you die or, yep. lose, or lose cognitive function. Yeah, and this is right, remaining humble in your process to learning and this is not just for doctors this is for everybody you know like we, we have to be constantly learning I love what Dr. Hugh Reardon said in one of his um, talks that we are co-learners with our patients and I thought that well, is brilliant that, that's a good way of putting it yeah, absolutely. That's, a, that's how a doctor should be approaching this okay now let's do, dive deep into the weeds here with vitamin C so Dr. Levy has written a book called Curing the Incurable please go out and get this book among many other books uh, he's written over 11 books uh, one uh, was it Death by Calcium uh, Reversing um, Magnesium uh, can you help me with the title? Magnesium reversing disease, yeah. Trying to find my, my notes here. Um, <laughs> yeah, death, a primal panacea. Uh, and his website, by the way, before we go any further, is peakenergy.com if you want to find out more about those books. Uh, really, really highly recommend people go and do that. But let's go into curing the incurable. When I listened to this book, unfortunately, Dr. Levy, after my father passed, um, I was just like, what the hell? And why has this been such a battle? And why is my dad, you know, not with me still? Because I am sure if you had been his physician from day one, my father would be still with us. And that's a big call to make, but this is what I believe based on the, your book and other research that I've done um, around this. Um, can you tell us, Curing the incurable, you, you talked about Dr. Klenner, you talked about Linus Pauling, uh, Dr. Erwin Stone. Can you give us a little bit of background? This is 40 years that you guys have been saying this stuff, you know, you and your uh, colleagues, that vitamin C is a... Well, Klenner in 1940, that's 1940, so that's uh, 80 years. 80 years, wow. Okay, got that wrong. 80 <laughs> years with Dr. Klenner and then Dr. Uh, Linus Pauling, um, Linus Pauling, Nobel Prize winner, two times um, in the 70s, I believe, was mm -hmm. the next sort of step in I that process. So. Yeah, so like we've known about this for so long. Why is it not getting that message across? You know, why, why are we? Well, 
this is not a medical issue, but you ask the direct question, I'll give you a direct answer. Money. Money runs everything. And the pharmaceuticals are multi-billion dollar industries. And what I've said many, many times is you don't bump out a billionaire. Billionaires will not be excluded. They'll not, they'll not be minimized. The only way you get something done is to hopefully analyze the situation and implement it in such a fashion that it doesn't threaten those profits. Okay. So, I mean, if you can put an additive into gasoline to make it a little more efficient, but not eliminate the gasoline, the companies will probably let you be. Mm -hmm. But if you come along with something that replaces gasoline, you don't think the gasoline oil companies are going to take it lying down. It's, it, it should not come as something surprising to people, except for the fact, and this is what people need to realize, doctors are the same type of people as any other profession, all mm -hmm. right? We beat our chest and we try to make ourselves angels, if you will, but we're not even close. You have wonderful politicians, you have vicious politicians, you have wonderful physicians, you have, I won't say vicious, I'll say uh, physicians that do not place the patient's welfare as their number one concern. Yeah. Whereas you have other physicians, unfortunately, in a tiny minority who would give their life for their patient. Yes, yeah, yeah. Can you really put them first? And these are quite rare and this is why, um, you know, this is like uh, having Dr. Ron Hanninghaki on recently. Uh, he's one of those, you know. Yes, he's, he's one spectacular. Of the, he's spectacular. Um, and he is one of my best friends, but that's one of the reasons why he's my best friend. Yeah, yes. because, I, and, and we just connected so well because I could see the heart in the man and the compassion. And, you know, I have had the privilege of having some those types of, of uh, doctors and scientists as well um, on this show because I search those types of people out who, who are not cowards. I mean, it, it might let me say this, since you mentioned Dr. Honey Hackey, uh, I don't have a clinical practice, but I often get emails from around the world uh, of people, how can I see you? How can I do that? Can you recommend somebody? Well, there's only one person on the planet that pretty much practices the way I would practice and that's Dr. Honey Hack. Yeah. So yeah. for someone who would be interested in following up on the type of concepts and now we're in this day and age of Zoom conferences and everything like that, mm -hmm. they have the facility to offer video consultations in which he can analyze the data and even if you can never see him directly, he can get you going in the right direction. Absolutely. That's a really good recommendation, you know, especially if you're fighting something serious, you know, right. um, you know, um, so back to the um, vitamin C story, we, so Linus Pauling on Dr. Cleaner first, firstly, uh, was using this in practice um, for, for back in the forties and had some miraculous, you know, and that, that word is probably not a good one to use because it implies something, but, had some incredible recoveries and saw this and then Linus Pauling's work where he had cancer patients who lived four times longer in his study and he was only using quite small doses of vitamin C. Um, and then of course the Mayo Clinic coming along and replicating his study, um, but using oral vitamin C, um, that's not a replication. <laughs> and that one is still being quoted. Uh, so, what is, what is it that vitamin C does? Let's get into a bit of biochemistry here um, and, and uh, help us understand why is it such a broad spectrum panacea? Why can it help sepsis, coronavirus, um, any virus, hepatitis, shingles, uh, yeah. right through to cancer? Well, first I would say, let's understand what causes disease. And when I say that, I mean all disease. I'm not talking about a percentage of the disease. What causes all disease is having an excessive amount of oxidation among your biomolecules relative to their normal state of reduction. So oxidation is when a molecule loses electrons and then it's in an oxidized state. Mm -hmm. When you have a biomolecule, RNA, DNA, protein, fat, uh, you name it, enzyme, and that molecule gets oxidized 
and loses one or more electrons, mm -hmm. it either becomes less functional or completely devoid of function. Right. So you completely take one biomolecule out, if you will, when it's oxidized. Now, you have different agents that oxidize and they're known as toxins. Mm -hmm. Toxin is the same thing as a pro-oxidant, free radical, they're synonyms. So the enemies of health, if you will, are toxins, no matter how you encounter them. Because all toxins cause toxicity and secondary disease by oxidation, nothing else. Right. Now, you might say, well, how could then just that cause so many different diseases? Well, that's because the toxins have different physical and chemical characteristics. One toxin goes in the fat, others goes in uh, water soluble, one penetrates membranes, one's ionic, one concentrates in this tissue. That gives you a variety of clinical disease because different areas and different biomolecules are being concentrated to varying in different degrees throughout the body. That's the entirety of what causes the disease. So when we hear this idea that uh, oxidation causes disease, well, yes, that's true, but it's much more accurate to say oxidation is disease, okay? Right. A, a tissue of a given disease, liver disease, whatever, uh, there's not an additional ill-defined thing that's wrong with that tissue other than the unique array of oxidation. Now, having said that, your basic overall goal of therapy is to reduce, in other words, donate electrons back to biomolecules that have been oxidized. Mm -hmm. And the extent to which you can do this pretty much dictates the extent to which you can either stop the progression reverse the progression, and in early stages, even resolve chronic disease, no matter what the disease. Right. So this is an antioxidant, okay? The toxin is a pro-oxidant, an oxidizing agent, and the antioxidant is a reducing agent. Oxid a toxin takes away electrons, antioxidant Oxidized. donates electrons. Now, vitamin C, even though there are many, many antioxidants out there, and they all have positive impact. The thing about vitamin C is, number one, it's a small molecule. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You can get everywhere. Number two, it's very close in structure to glucose. Now, we mm -hmm. know every cell in your body takes up glucose. Yep. So vitamin C tags along and uses the same mechanisms as glucose for uptake into the cell. Right. Number three, each vitamin C molecule can donate two electrons rather than one. So wow. that makes it doubly important. Uh, number four, it has an intermediate stable state. Uh, we know we talk about how vitamin C gets used up quick and that's true, but it's sort of a biochemical phenomenon type thing. When the vitamin C loses one electron, it can stay indefinitely in the intermediate state where it can either donate another electron or actually go in the opposite direction. And when you have a lot of vitamin C in the cell, what happens when you reduce, oxidize, reduce, oxidize, give, take, give, take, give, take, give, take, you induce microcurrents, okay? Uh -huh. so Electron flow is a yep. current. So we like and the more batteries. effective, Right, the more effectively vitamin C can do this trillions of times a second yep. determines as to how well you can establish healthy microcurrents inside your cells with healthy, transmembrane voltages across the membranes. So this is meaning like, so oxidation isn't always a bad thing, is it though? Like when no, I No, no, not do, at all. So when I do exercise, I'm causing an oxidative stress onto my body and it's causing a hermetic effect that hopefully my body's gonna send more soldiers to build my muscles stronger or whatever the case may be. Um, so this is like a redox, is, a, is like a cycle that is, um, important and it's the cycling of the electrons that creates this microcurrent. It's the whole thing is designed. You're right. There's oxidation reduction and oxidation is part of it. Okay. Yeah. The thing about a toxin is a toxin takes electrons and keeps it. I uh, gotcha. So yeah. Vitamin C gives electrons and then when you take them away from electrons, it goes back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. But the toxin, once it takes the electrons, it becomes 
electronically more stable, biochemically more stable, and it doesn't give the electrons up. So that's a net theft of electrons from oh, the tissues. Wow. Yeah. So this is <clears throat> stealing your energy. Stealing. And, and the thing about it is with the oxidation, you, you need oxidation to stay alive. The thing about, but one of the things oxidation does is it helps you relocate the energy containing molecule where you need it. Okay, so right. you, uh, when you have vitamin C in the blood, uh, you need active transport, you need to consume energy to get vitamin C inside the cell. It got, yeah, okay. and this okay. is, yep. Okay, and so the purpose of part of the energy is to get your energy providing substance in an area where it better does its function. So yeah, you absolutely need oxidation to balance back and off this. And the other thing too is when your oxidized vitamin C level gets high in the blood, then you pass into the cell without the consumption of energy, but then you need to consume energy inside the cell to restore yeah. the vitamin C back to its reduced state. But the important thing there is, the vitamin C has unique ways of taking that energy and getting it where it's needed. So just because you're consuming another antioxidant to reduce vitamin C back to its normal state, that's not a loss of energy. It's a translocation of energy. Yep. So that's with things like glutathione, whether it's going backwards and forwards. Um, right. And so this is the, the transporter that, what is it, the SVCT2 transporter that's getting it into the, to the cell, the, getting the vitamin C into the cell. So if we go, say, uh, intravenous versus oral versus liposomal delivery of vitamin C, um, oral has certain limitations, although important for everyday use. Liposomal vitamin C, like that we've, you know, we're all hearing about liposomal vitamin C. Is that a better way of delivery? What is the difference between intravenous, oral, and liposomal, in short, perhaps? Well, I, mean, I well, first of all, when somebody says, what would you use? My answer is all of them. All of them, yeah. Okay. And, and I'm not going to arbitrarily, if I'm sick, just use one and not the other. Okay. They all have their own unique contribution. Intravenous obviously allows you to get an extremely large amount of vitamin C inside the body much more quickly and at a higher concentration than you could by any, any other form. Yep. However, I also just told you that the vitamin C in the blood, you need to consume energy to get the vitamin C inside the cell in its reduced form, mm. okay? Well, when you take liposome encapsulated vitamin C, because it's like a little cell, a little fat globule, cell-like structure, and it's got the same construction around the liposome is the natural cell membranes in your body. Mm -hmm. So that gets absorbed almost completely and very promptly in the gut, unlike the other oral forms. Yep. And then once it's inside there, it's either in the lymph or the blood. The lymph it eventually makes its way to the blood. And then as the blood circulates, the liposomes can then get inside the cell without the consumption of energy. With it. So if you've got a very sick patient who isn't really responsive to um, recovery, like, you know, can't handle a lot of oxidative uh, stress, this would be a better delivery system perhaps to get it to them without... Um, well, or, certainly if you that. have a loved one who's uh, in the hospital and... You can't get the doctors are giving you a hard time, <laughs> yes. and they don't, and they don't have a tube down their throat. Yes, and I would have done that if I had my case with my father, but he was unfortunately intubated, right. um, so I, I was stuffed in that. I had lipospheric in the hospital room, ready to go for when he was extubated, but unfortunately, we never got there. Um, so I, I was re reliant on the intravenous way. And the intravenous is, like you say, a very, very powerful way for someone who is in such dire, dire straits, um, you know, as, as my father was in sepsis. Um, can we, uh, so just one question on the liposomal. I was concerned about the number of omega-6 
it's a phospholipid. Uh, there's a lot of mega six in the delivery mechanism. Is that going to be a problem when you've got, you know, we, we tend to have too many omega sixes and not enough omega threes in our diet. Um, if you're taking a lot of liposomal vitamin C that way, is that an issue or not really? I don't think so. The, the type of lipid that's in the liposomes, in this case, we're talking about the, uh, the live on product. I got to say that because there's a lot of fraudulent liposomes out there. Oh, okay. Live on. Uh, live okay. on became so uh, prosperous so quick. Everybody wanted to jump on the bandwagon and in the process, not realize that it's a very complicated process to make a quality uh -huh. liposome. Uh -huh. But those other comp companies had no problem with it. They just lied. They just didn't make okay. proper okay. liposomes. Okay. Waiting to get the letter so that they can stop, but have been having made an ungodly amount of profit uh -huh. until they're told to stop. Wow. But okay. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the liposome lipid is phosphatidylcholine. Yes. And this phosphatidylcholine is identical to the phosphatidylcholine that's in the natural cell walls of your body. So, uh, uh, so, so you're, you're, no really, problem. it's the liposome itself is a positive supplement in addition to what's inside the liposome. Uh-huh. Oh, that clears that one up for me. Because um, I was concerned about the amount of omega-6s that I might be getting giving to my mum in this case um, recently through liposomal delivery. Um, okay, so now let's, let's go over to... Um, I was fascinated by the work of Dr. Merrick, Dr. Paul Merrick. Um, I think you know of his uh, study with um, intravenous vitamin C in the ICU setting. Unfortunately, it wasn't a double uh, blind placebo controlled trial, but he had a small trial with 96 uh, patients, 47 in the control and 47 uh, who received vitamin C. Now these were very small doses um, and Dr. Barry Fowler has also done this uh, similar work, and Dr. Barry Fowler's coming on in a, in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, so Dr. Merrick, he reduced, this is, this is the statistic that got me, um, and what I used when I was advocating for my father, a 40% mortality rate was in the control group with sepsis and a, um, ARDS, 8% when they got the vitamin C, along with hydrocortisone and thiamine. Um, that's a hell of a drop. And those are all people. Those are people that are still walking around and, now. And this is a, a small study. And the thing that maddens me is when you want to try something different, some of the standard opposition is, well, you don't have a double blind placebo control, yeah, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Well, blah, blah, blah. number one, <laughs> if you have something which as a competent cl clinician, you know has helped and very importantly, has no defined toxicity. Exactly. And is not experimental and is inexpensive. The only time the trials that you're talking about are warranted is when you're using a drug that has the potential to have a greater bear of positive effect, but also has the potential downside for negative side effects. So you need to balance one against the other. And this is a legal When you're thing, talking right? about something like vitamin C, yep. which is the most important nutrient in your body, it's a ridiculous and foundationless argument. Yeah. So it's, to me, unethical to the highest degree if you're a clinician and you've given just one patient who is just absolutely on death's doorstep, intravenous vitamin C, and the next day they're well or 90% <laughs> well. You don't need to repeat that with a thousand patients. You don't need to repeat it with five patients. Okay, so we really have, if you'll excuse the expression, a back asswards way of approaching research. <laughs> yes. But it's all designed, as I said before, to do the one thing. Pharmaceuticals. Support the pharmaceuticals. Yeah, and this is a legal thing, isn't it? Because evidence-based really was, uh, and this is Dr. Ron Hanihake said this to me, uh, evidence-based is not evidence-based. It was designed for the pharmaceutical companies so that they could defend their drug in a, in a, in a court case that they did with a placebo-controlled group that didn't get it so that they could prove it. But it, 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 it's not a practicable approach for all of medicine to do it in this style. I mean, hyperbaric, I use as an example, I do hyperbaric oxygen therapy, was a key player in my mother's rehabilitation from her brain aneurysm. 
um, also in the oxidative medicine family. Um, they did a trial, a, a clinical trial, but the people know if they're getting hyperbaric. So they did the control was 1.3 atmospheres and the other one was 1.5 atmospheres. Well, 1.3 is a, a, it's not a placebo. It's a, that's a no, treatment. Not at all. <laughs> so they all got better and they said, well, they all got better. So therefore there is no, you know, and it's just like, ah, <laughs> seriously. Um, or in Dr. Merrick's study with the, or uh, in the Citrus Ali study, sorry, um, where the, the, the SOFA scores were taken uh, as the primary uh, endpoint and not mortality is sort of backwards in my head. Surely we should be looking, did these people die or not, rather than the sequential multi-organ failure score um, as being the, I, I get why they did it for, because they were, it was a, a, an early stage study, but it, it did throw a spanner in the works. And that wasn't a sepsis study, that was an ARD study because they had already had sepsis for, for too long. And that's why we probably didn't see uh, the, the dramatic results in that one. Because that, that was one of the studies that was chucked back at me when I was fighting for my father. The Citrus Ali study says, blah, 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 blah. Didn't help with the SOFA score, didn't help with the CRP, didn't help with uh, a couple of the other markers. And I was like, uh, mortality and days in ICU, it did help with. And these people were already extremely sick because when they came into the study, they were already very far along the process. Which is what medicine likes to do with their prescription drug. Right now with the coronavirus in the US, I suppose elsewhere in the world, they have remdesivir. And yes. they're doing trials on remdesivir with the end point of looking for less days hospitalized. Yeah. So I mean, that, that's the same thing yeah, uh, that, that they trashed on the one hand, but that's their end point with this insufficient drug therapy, if you will. Let's see if it helps a little bit. And now we're gonna get all excited. We, we took a prescription drug and we lessened the hospital days by 10, 20, 30, 40%. Yeah. Uh, but we'll ignore vitamin C that could actually get the people and prevent them from dying. Um, Even though it's also place. been documented by hackneyed studies to decrease length of hospitalization as well. As well, as well. And there have been studies uh, around the world now with the coronavirus, right. haven't there, with vitamin C. Quite um, a bit, yeah. So <laughs> a really uh, sarcastic question. Do you think Dr. Trump's, uh, Dr. Trump, President Trump is getting vitamin C right now? Or is he on remdesivir? <laughs> well, you know, I don't have, a, I, I don't have a, a crystal ball, but I think he is getting what was reported, which was, and this is significant. Nobody talks about this, but had this happened at the beginning of the pandemic, it would have been just incredible news. But shows like yours, the articles on the orthomolecular medicine news service, all this stuff, it's absolutely mind blowing to me that it's in the mainstream news very casually mentioned that President Trump was getting zinc, mm -hmm. vitamin D, oh, wow. melatonin. Oh, wow. Uh, yes, okay. And I mean, that was out there up front. What's our president, what, what, the, what the medical community must have just uh, choked on their tongue when they saw that our president was getting at least really? some natural approach. To, uh, to to bring his uh, bring his virus under control. Oh, the hit the I doubt he was using like the vitamin C, but uh, it's possible. Oh, wow! But at least he's on the melatonin and the, the, the zinc. I mean, that that, that is a step forward. So, <laughs> but you know, like um, uh, and you hear this I uh, think from the head of the FDA, none of that has been proven to help. Uh, vitamins A, B, C, D, zinc melatonin, vitamin C, none you of it's see, that's been just proven. That's, it's, that's where politics gets into medicine. Yeah. I've often said, and I'm sad to say it, and I don't mean to be sarcastic at all. There's more politics in medicine than there is in politics. Yeah. Yeah. You have, get, you have a better chance of a politician giving you an honest statement about a controversial issue than you have uh, a drug representative or a physician representing a drug company giving you the straight poop about a drug. Yeah. Uh, what you just said, and they'll say it all the time, there's no study this, there's no study that. 
it's a bald-faced lie. What, yeah. what can you say beyond the fact that they're just lying? Now, let me say, let me backtrack from lie. I should say they're telling something that's wrong. Lie means intent. So I can't tell you whether it's their intent to lie. Like, I know I'm mm -hmm. telling you something that's wrong. But there's no question that most of the time, they're just telling you something that's factually not true. And I dare say, most of the time, a deliberate lie. And it's, it's, it's ignorance. I mean, you know, when- it, No, it, nothing it, wrong with ignorance. Nothing <laughs> wrong with ignorance. But they won't go and look at the damn studies and there for you the go. starters. I mean, ignorance you know? can be remedied because <laughs> ignorance doesn't mean you have to have a closed mind. It just means you have a mind that hasn't been exposed. Yeah. I mean, like we, you know, this, with, the study, uh, with the situation with my father, I had the studies. I was working with doctors outside who were helping me get the studies, present the studies, and they said, don't want to see them. Won't be presenting them. All we're worried about is, is it legal? And whether our staff are not trained in doing vitamin C infusions and whether we are allowed to do it. It was not about the, the clinical. Well, in New Zealand, it's a registered medicine. And not in the hospitals. I was told point blank it is an unlicensed medicine in our, our local hospital. I think, hospital. I'm not sure, but I think you can, you can say that was another lie. Yeah. A lot of times a pharmacy, they'll, just, they'll lie like anybody else. Yeah. It's something they don't want to do. And so they'll just toss it aside. Oh, it's not allowed. Yeah. Until you take the law book and yeah. stick it in their face and say, you're wrong. Stop lying. But you, you know, as a lawyer and as someone who's brilliant, can do that. A loved one who's fighting for their family who hasn't slept in two weeks, who doesn't uh, know about yeah. the law, is buggered to be quite fair, you know. Um, and, and so this is, you know, why I'm doing these, these interviews, because I want people to be just made aware of this sort of uh, situation. So, okay, vitamin C can help and we've seen the studies now um, and perhaps we'll, we will link to some of the studies in the show notes with sepsis and there are, uh, uh, who was it? Dr. Barry Fowler said, use this analogy, just in the States, two 747s of, of people are dying every single day of sepsis who don't need to be dying, who are crashing into the ground. Basically that number of people are dying daily in the States alone, let alone the rest of the world from sepsis which could be drastically uh helped with uh intravenous vitamin c um do you think uh like dr merrick in included thiamine and hydrocortisone is that a necessary uh additive or a beneficial additive to to that protocol or is vitamin c the key player here yeah no they're not necessary at all that's not to say they didn't have a positive impact. I mean, like when people ask about supplements, so what supplements should I take? And I mentioned something that they, what about this, this, and this? I said, well, those are all good too. But I mean, so, yeah. but as far as being vital to the response, no. And in fact, predating Dr. Merrick's study, about a year earlier, they did a study in Iran, of all places, uh -huh. uh, with patients with sepsis getting roughly the same dose of vitamin C every six hours, and that was it. Yep. So and they got grams. the same response yep. and mortality rate. Wow. One wow. thing about the hydrocortisone that makes it especially unnecessary in sepsis is sepsis is a state where you have massive infection, massive increased oxidative stress throughout the body. Well, when you have increased oxidative stress, what are you going to do? You're gonna, like we talked earlier, oxidize biomolecules. Mm -hmm. Well, as it turns out, in addition to oxidizing a lot of biomolecules, you also oxidize the cortisol receptors. Cortisols uh -huh. have the receptors they bind yep. to. Yep. Well, I just said, what happens when you oxidize a biomolecule? It doesn't work. So those receptors uh -huh. aren't taking up the cortisol anymore. Oh. So the body's natural reflex is to produce a large amount of cortisol. Yes, and in fact, they've documented in septic, pa septic patients that there's already a high level of endogenous hydrocortisone. Yeah. So then what happens when you give vitamin C? When you give vitamin C, one of the first things it does is it starts 
reducing those oxidized hydrocortisone receptors and then the hydrocortisone that's already circulating in the body Kindle. binds to the receptors and yeah. gets taken up into the cell. Okay. So you and one of the primary functions of hydrocortisone, not well known, I don't believe, is that it profoundly increases the uptake of vitamin C inside the cell. Uh huh. Is that why it would be ah, beneficial? Is that why Dr. Merrick perhaps used it in this case? Uh, we don't we can't really comment. No, I don't. I don't think so because if if that was the case, he wouldn't have given the hydrocortisone at all. I mean, you're you're already you got you're giving something that's, al that's already present in high amounts inside the Could, body. Yeah. So but for, for, I can't say for sure what his reasoning was. Yeah, or maybe it was a limitation of the study, and he had to use a drug. Um, possibly, we we conjecture here. Um, so the when when you release cortisol, just for people listening. It is an anti-inflammatory, isn't it? It's one of the stress hormones, and it basically takes energy away from you know you making inflammatory responses, and that is his beneficial uh, use, you know. Right, yeah. and it's it's my opinion, based on the evidence as I reviewed over the years, is that vitamin c of course is a powerful anti-inflammatory and i would tell you that the reason hydrocortisone is a powerful anti-inflammatory is because it gets the most important anti-inflammatory vitamin c inside the cells where it's so we needed. don't need it that, yep, that, that makes that makes good sense um are you aware of remember anti-inflammatory just means you're in an area of increased oxidative stress that needs more electrons brought into it that's all inflammation is Right, and that's and another point too to to buttress all of this is when you have inflammation starting anywhere. I often talk about the coronary artery getting mm -hmm. inflamed. Mm -hmm. Vitamin C levels go down to nil, so you have a lot of oxidative stress inside the blood vessel. Okay, and what's the first immune cell to show up as a as a neutrophils? As a, neutrophils, more specifically, the macrophage. Macrophage, and okay. the macrophage has. 80 fold, 8,000% more vitamin C inside it than the blood. Wow. So it. all you're doing, in my humble scientific opinion, I think personally and scientifically that the primary role of the immune system, since it's precipitated always by areas of increased inflammation and yep. increased oxidative stress, yep. mm -hmm. my opinion is the primary, not the only, but the primary role of the immune system is to bring vitamin C where it's most depleted. Wow. And that's what the macrophages are doing. Right. So are you aware of the work of Professor Margaret Visses? Uh, she's a professor here in New Zealand at Otago uh -huh. University and Dr. Nitra Carr as well. But uh, Professor Visses is coming on um, next week on the show. And uh, I, for, forgive me, I don't have a scientific background. I'm trying to get my head around all this uh, science, um, biochemistry. But she had showed on, on, on one of her lectures the neutrophils coming to the site of infection, say uh, pneumonia or sepsis, eating the bacteria into, into the neutrophils. They gorge on these bacteria. That's a good thing. The, the uh, bacteria then inside the neutrophils, and if the neutrophils don't have vitamin C in them, they vomit out, for the want of a better description, their own DNA eventually they sort of explode and, and bleep out and put all this DNA into the, where are they putting it? Cytoplasm. Um, and this is causing, so when you get white out on the lungs, that's lungs being filled up with neutrophils. And then the macrophages are meant to come along and eat the neutrophils from what I understand. And they will only do that if there is vitamin C in the neutrophils. If I yeah, well, that, both, the, is... both the macrophages and the neutrophils are phagocytic. Okay, uh -huh. they'll, they'll, okay. They'll and yeah. even though the macrophage has the most, I said 8,000% more vitamin C than the blood, the neutrophils have four to 5,000% more vitamin C in the blood. Wow. So they're sort of like, uh, with regard to vitamin C content, they're right up there with the macrophage, and both the macrophage and the neutrophil have these phagocytic Pac Man like qualities, if you will. Yeah. And they're eating the bugs and getting rid of them. So she, she was talking about um, 
Well, no, Dr. Barry Fowler was it? Oh God, I'm mixing my things up. Nets, neutrophil extracellular traps. Have you heard of those? And the I'm not familiar with that one, no. The vitamin C prevents, from what I understand, uh, and we'll have Professor Margaret on next week, uh, that it, it stops the neutrophils from uh, regurgitating basically their own DNA and poisoning the space around them. And then the macrophages won't eat them. And then in the case of, say, um, ARDS, or acute respiratory distress syndrome, you've got whiteout and you can't get rid of it. It's, it's um, not going to go away and it's not going to be taken out by the, by the macrophages. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to, work, uh, to look at those nets, um, neutrophil extracellular traps. Uh, it was Dr. Barry Fowler that was talking about that. But I've got so much um, research in my head, I'm probably mixing my <laughs> professors. <laughs> and not having a biochemistry degree anyway, um, I'm doing my best. Um, so hopefully I haven't butchered that. Okay, so what should people do on a practical standpoint? If someone is in hospital with a loved one, they've got pneumonia, they've got coronavirus, they've got sepsis, how can they get their, their doctors to give intravenous vitamin C or liposomal delivered vitamin C? What would be your, you know, so they're not in a situation like I was fighting against the machinery. So uh, we're talking about someone who's not intubated yet. Yes, because when they're okay. intubated, you're buggered. Um, right, right. <clears throat> but it, you gave me a couple of things that I never thought to uh, bring into the conversation with the doctors. Um, I brought in the clinical studies, I brought in the, you know, um, the, the evidence, but it was, you know, saying to the doctor, I'm gonna come after you and I'm gonna sue you if you don't do this because the evidence is there. Um, and draw the vitamin C level. And when it comes back low, this doctor is a nutrient level that's low, please treat it. Yep. Okay, so get the vitamin C treated. By the way, in my local hospital, they were unable to test it. Okay. So that's just ridiculous. Is it a very difficult thing to test for vitamin C levels? I don't think so. Oh. Not that I know of. I mean, oh. you know, it involves a certain technique, and you either have the technique or you don't, but yeah. it's not something sort of exotic or out there, no. Oh, wow. Okay. So anyone who is in that situation, basically, you need to get vitamin C in somehow and ideally you are having it in six hourly intermittent constant levels so that you're because vitamin c has a very short half-life can you explain that a little bit why the intermittent like the every six hours is crucial well it's just excreted that rapidly in the blood once it's in the uh once it's excreted that rapidly in the kidneys once it's in the blood you know a lot like that, and then it goes down quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have every six hours so that as it starts going down, you have another bump up so that you more or less keep a, a steady state, which is also why liposomes are so good because once they get taken up inside the cell, they effectively become a long-acting form of vitamin C because they're, they've been taken out of the area where they can be rapidly excreted. Uh -huh. You know, you're talking about what to do for a patient in the hospital. And this would help anybody, but it would especially help with the acute viral infection, the respiratory problem, and the coronavirus. And believe it or not, it actually relates back to vitamin C. And that's the nebulization or inhalation of hydrogen peroxide. Oh, yes, I wanted to ask Hydrogen that. peroxide, okay, little known facts. Number one, inside the body and inside the lungs, after it kills the pathogen, you know what's left? Oxygen and water. Wow. That's the breakdown products of hydrogen peroxide. So at the same time, you kill the pathogen, you do the two things that are most important for healing a tissue. You hydrate it and you oxygenate it. Okay. Yeah. Number two is we now know that the respiratory lining of the lungs naturally produces and excretes hydrogen peroxide 24 seven, so that you actually have hydrogen peroxide existing already endogenously to protect you against new pathogens that you breathe in. And when you get an infection, wow. that production increases. 
So all you're doing with hydrogen peroxide nebulization That's is cool. you're augmenting a natural response. Wow. And add to that the fact that there's been no, no infections, pathogens of any type that have been found to be resistant to uh, hydrogen peroxide. Now, vitamin C and hydrogen peroxide. <laughs> The Fenton the reaction, vitamin C goes in, donates the electron to iron, which passes along the peroxide, make hydroxyl radical, oxidize and kill the cell or the pathogen or whatever. Another thing, little known fact that vitamin C does is outside of the cell, it stimulates hydrogen peroxide production. So it causes more peroxide to be produced, which then passes easily into the cell and continues to give the vitamin C inside the cell more fuel to result in the oxidative reaction that uh, kills the pathogen. Wow. So, okay, nebulizing uh, hydrogen peroxide, so just your normal 3% food grade hydrogen peroxide that you can buy at the chemist or the... Right. 3% or less. Some 3 people, 3% 3 less. is a little potent, but if it's not, that's great. But you, you can get a very positive response with, with half a percent or a tenth of a percent. But I, said, I say, the why, not, why not go up to the percent that you easily tolerate uh, and get the job done a little more quickly? Is, it, is there any danger with um, people, you know, going out buying nebulizers? So when you, when you buy a little nebulizer, is that like, like the essential oil sort of thing, you know, that you have? Do you need to have a towel over your face, sort of like you do when you get a cold and you put... Um, menthol or something in it have you <laughs> you've got one for me oh okay no that, that wasn't what i was picturing okay oh great yeah, yeah, nebulizer okay and, and, and you put just the liquid put that in, in here. yep and then you just breathe it, Turn it off. and for five to ten minutes sort of uh yeah. a day it's a prophylactic no yeah and if you've got a cold or something like that it would help or flu or, or things like this that. sounds grandiose but i want to say anybody that's listening if you have this device and you have your peroxide you need never suffer from a cold or respiratory virus again which oh, also yeah. means influenza or flu wow you should never suffer from that again i don't know i i, I can't make it any clearer than that no that's amazing is this but, like so but, but once you have the nebulizer, you know how much the vitamin C cost cure your cold or flu? Uh, well, a little bit more. Less, less than 10 cents. <laughs> really? Like the vitamin C side of things? No, it's much cheaper than vitamin C. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, the hydrogen peroxide. Yes. Would, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so hydrogen peroxide and vitamin oh, C. Oh, and if people want what protocols or articles, uh, you could give them my email. I don't, I don't try to hide from people who I get all uh, upset and agitated about something. And uh, I mean, I can't do consultations. Yeah. But if people want information, uh, a little guidance, uh, you can give them my uh, email address. Wow. Are you sure? <laughs> you might get no, no problem. Agitated. No problem. It's wow. been available for many years it. now. Okay. Um, that's, that's amazing. Um, what is the email address that people can get you on then, Dr. Thomas, if you... Well, it's my initials, T-E, Thomas Edward, T-E, last name Levy, L-E-V-Y-M-D, T-E-L-E-V-Y-M-D, at yahoo.com. At yahoo.com. Wow, that's very, very, very generous of you. Um, is ozone, because I've been studying ozone as well, um, I've got a home ozone machine here, is that... The, that's related to hydrogen peroxide too, isn't it? That, that yes, it's interesting. Hydrogen peroxide, in the hydrogen peroxide, ozone, ultraviolet light, mm -hmm. hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Yeah, they're all basically doing the same thing, just but by different routes and different points of access. Wow. I mean, ozone. Well, I mean, I can't. I got to say it for the peroxide too. But ozone is probably, if you had to pick one the single most potent anti-pathogen agent there is. Wow. You put ozone in the presence of a pathogen, pathogen's it. gone, okay? Yeah. So, but most of these therapies that I'm telling you about have an equal impact if you apply them correctly. And, and of course, the only reason that ozone shouldn't be at the number, number one on top of the list is 
access, ozone yeah. machine, physician control. What I said with hydrogen peroxide, uh, you do unless you don't it. have a, unless you don't have current, you can use batteries. Uh, you can do in the Serengeti in Africa. Wow. Okay. You yeah. know, so, so you that's don't need that, a machine. You don't access everywhere on the planet, uh, to real. And, and the other thing too, is even if you don't have a nebulizer and you really want to take it down to bare bones, you can, uh, take a little spray and spray the back of your throat several times early on. And that will probably do the trick as well. Just not as effectively if you've already let it get down into your lungs, whatever the wow. infection is, but, this is, you're using nature's natural antibiotic. Peroxide is produced in every cell of the body, in the extracellular space, uh, and it breaks down into water and oxygen. What horrible metabolic byproducts. <laughs> and, and so this, all, this whole uh, family of oxidative medicines, I mean, I've studied exactly. hyperbaric, I've had a hyperbaric clinic, I've got ozone here, uh, I'm going to get the peroxide, I definitely do intravenous vitamin C, and all sorts of vitamin C. These are all in the oxidative family and these are all have uh, the ability to get more oxygen delivered to the cells and more nutrients in the case of vitamin C to the cells. So they all have a very similar basis or mechanism of action, don't they? Yes. Uh, and yes, this that's is why they, they, they work on a, such a broad spectrum from Corona to cancer. Um, and, and the powerful agents, because I think the, the, you know, going back to pharmaceuticals, they don't like broad spectrum things either, because if you've got something that can fix that, but that, but that as well, then, oh, it can't possibly be right. And uh, we can't sell the drug for this, for this, for this, and that, if, if we've got that in there. Therefore, this oxidative medicine family is just being ignored across the board. So ozone has, is also facing the same issues. Hyperbaric is facing the same issues, as is vitamin C. I haven't studied UV irradiation, but that's next on my radar as well. Um, so it, it, it's the same problem right across. And I have seen, you know, with my, my latest book, um, telling the story with my mum, bringing her back, that hyperbaric oxygen therapy was a massive part of her brain's recovery. We could get Absolutely. oxygen to the cells. Um, I got into vitamin C later in the piece, and she has an intravenous vitamin C uh, every week, <clears throat> and we do uh, six grams a day for her orally as well um and my mum is now 79 and she is at 74 and a half um or she's yeah, turning 79 and we were told she would never do anything again never have any quality of life put her in an institution and she'll be gone within a few months very likely and i just absolutely refuse to believe this and not, even though i'm not a doctor i was able to find all these great things by accessing great minds like yourself reading the books doing the hard yards doing the thousands of hours of retraining the brain and doing the research and doing the hard yards and now i've got my mum back and so that really makes me want you know want to fight for people to because I get frustrated. I've lost a friend this week to cancer. I've I've lost you know parents um, of of friends a few weeks ago. People, unfortunately, when I go to tell them something and send them off in the right area of research, very often go, no, my doctor says that's rubbish, and therefore I'm not listening to you, and I'm just well, like. You know, well, what I just said, let me put a put a little punctuation mark and an uh, exclamation point on what I just said. But if everybody on the planet had access to hydrogen peroxide nebulization and started doing it, there wouldn't be a single case on coronavirus on the planet in a week. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that's a really big call. And that's a, so we should be we should be getting this in our arsenal at home right now all around the world, because this is something that's achievable, easy, cheap, um, and something that we can do proactively. Are there any dangers with people doing peroxide? Can we overdose? Can we do anything well, now, wrong? Uh, only if you start going to very high concentrations. Anything that's pro-oxidant, and obviously hydrogen peroxide is pro-oxidant because it's killing the pathogens. Mm -hmm. You're not killing the pathogens with an antioxidant effect. If you continue on high dose peroxide, yeah, you can start causing oxidative damage 
just like with anything else. But at 3% or below, the only thing you might notice if you're doing too much is you might start getting a little irritation in the nose, a little soreness in the throat, well, you've really gone too far, but only because you've killed all the pathogens and now you're starting to irritate the normal tissue. Right. So with ozone, it's different. So like with ozone, you can't breathe ozone in. No, no. Because that's you, the only way. You can way. take it just about anywhere else, but boy, yeah. the, the lungs don't like the ozone at all. No. So and that's the, the interesting only... thing too, is I told you about peroxide breaking down to hydrogen and oxygen, uh, water and oxygen. If you, if you use an oximeter and you're mm -hmm. running about 95 and then you start nebulizing, after 30 seconds to a minute, you're going to start seeing that oxygenation level go up 96, 97, 98, 99, wow. sometimes 100. Wow, that is absolutely, I've got an um, oximeter coming because breathing, um, breathing techniques are another thing that can actually um, change your whole chemistry in your body with carbon dioxide and so on. This is also a very uh, interesting and powerful mechanism. I don't know if you're aware of the work of Do um, Patrick McCown, um, a great book, The Oxygen Advantage. And again, it's helping the body use its own mechanisms, breathing in this case, um, to opt, you know, optimize the delivery of oxygen by raising our tolerance to carbon dioxide levels, which has been a very fascinating read um, that I'll be covering off on another episode. Dr. Levy, you've, um, just before I let you go, because I know we've, we've rabbited it on for a fair, fair while and covered a lot of ground. I heard you in talk in one of your lectures, and I haven't read this book yet, the Magne Magnesium Reverses Disease. Mm -hmm. Briefly touch, because, um, uh, and, and the Death by Calcium book as well. Um, this was news to me, that calcium, if we start there, calcium we need in the body, it's an essential nutrient, but if it's in the wrong places, uh, we can be running into trouble, and this is causing so, problems as well. It's a toxic nutrient. Iron, copper, and calcium are your three toxic nutrients. You absolutely need them in low levels, and above those levels, they're all absolutely toxic. Wow. Okay, so every disease cell, I don't care what the disease is, whether it's an infection, toxin, lupus, scleroderma, every disease cell has increased intracellular oxidative stress, which is always caused by calcium. Always. Wow. Increase the calcium, you increase the stress, and then magnesium is the yin and yang. You increase your magnesium, you decrease your calcium. They're physiological antagonists. That's why magnesium is, and this may shock some people, your most important single supplement. Yeah. I, I, because when I you're magnesium deficient, nothing can substitute for magnesium, and most people are deficient. But let's say you're deficient in vitamin C, you can partially compensate by taking other antioxidants. So when people like to just play, well, what's your most important oxidant uh, 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 supplement? Oh, yeah. In magnesium. Of Is course, it? I'm going to take vitamin C and vitamin D and vitamin K2 as well yep. and iodine. But magnesium is the only one that cannot be substituted for. Well, vitamin D can't be substituted for either, but... Yeah. Uh, a magnesium deficiency causes many diseases and makes all diseases worse. Is there a good type of uh, magnesium? Like, because uh, there's like three, I don't know, them all three and eight and uh, who, who Well, you know, there are many good ones. You have the anion and you have the cation, okay? You've got the magnesium, the cation, and the anion can be can be of no consequence or major consequence of clinical impact on your body as well. Magnesium chloride, interestingly, is extremely important in uh, inhibiting and eradicating infections, especially viral. Uh, so I'm going to talk about coronavirus. I say your magnesium supplementation should be in the magnesium chloride form. Uh -huh. You know, when you're dealing with a a brain problem, well, then your magnesium three and eight that gets mm -hmm. across the blood brain barrier well. But all of them, the glycinate and the uh, uh, carbonate, they, they all have their own unique features. Uh, and it's just a question of uh, what else you want to take along with it. So you take want a mixture. Anion right. So you'd, you'd take a mixture of different types of magnesium, perhaps, to cover all your bases, ideally. Yep. 
And so, if, the, if they're not covered with other supplements, yes. Okay, so 600 to 1,000 milligrams, I've heard you say, is a good, um, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's about right. The thing is, is the, the magnesium is like the vitamin C orally. Yep. You take too much too quick, you get the diarrhea. osmotic diarrhea and the loose bowels. Yeah. So uh, you're probably never going to take enough magnesium if you take a one single dose a day. Uh, uh, rather than spreading it out, just like because if you C. spread it out, you can get a lot more in without causing the loose before bowel you effect. get the diarrhea. So go to that point bef just before diarrhea, and then have this intermittently throughout the day. Um, it, you mentioned iron as being a uh, nu uh, essential nutrient, but a toxic in higher doses. I'm a little bit concerned because I have suffered with anemia in my entire athletic career. So I've been a you know extreme endurance athlete. Um, and I've taken a lot of iron. Have I done myself damage? Should I be not? Well, you do a lot of aerobic. Yeah. And you do a lot of sweating. Yeah. And the one study they showed way back when was roughly 50% of young athletic men and women in different schools and different sports were able to push themselves into an iron deficiency anemia by the end of their athletic season. Mm which just reflects how much, how much iron you can lose in your sweat. Yeah. So without looking at your ferritin levels, I would say statistically speaking, unless you just took a ton of iron, you're probably still uh, in a nice low range of iron because of the fact that uh, sweating is part of your lifestyle. But you should never supplement iron unless you have not an anemia, but an iron deficiency anemia. Oh, which is, okay. which is not, a, it, it, not just any old anemia. It has to be an anemia secondary to iron deficiency, which has a characteristic morphology, what's called hypochromic and microcytic. Mm. Tiny, tiny, but tiny blood cells with small amounts of hemoglobin inside them. That's an iron deficiency anemia. Uh -huh. And then you only take enough iron to get your blood level back to normal because you don't want your ferritin going above, say, 35. 25, 30 or so. Wow. Okay. So mine, my, mine has always, you know, hovered around the 10 to 12 and it's always been a, a That's massive good. problem. That's good. Um, so, but yeah, the, the 10 to 12 probably indicates that your anemia was iron deficient. So yeah. it just without knowing a lot of detail, it sounds like I'd be okay your, your, your minimal intaking of the, of the iron was appropriate for your particular condition. Yeah, because I was constantly, as an athlete, of course, my ability to carry oxygen with my hemoglobin being low and my, um, uh, and, uh, you know, iron deficiency, that was always a problem for a competitive athlete because you just couldn't, you didn't have the, the lungs or the, the ability to carry enough oxygen. Um, okay, and iodine, is there a danger? Because I've heard Dr. Brownstein talk about the essential nature of iodine. Um, if someone has Hashimoto's, is that a caveat for having iodine though? Because I took, I gave my mother iodine and she has Hashimoto's. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not, I can't PSAs. give you a yay or nay on that. I'm not really an expert on that particular thing. So I, I so I, I, my inclination is it's still fine to take the iodine, but I don't have a sophisticated level of knowledge on that, so on I don't want to particular. give you an absolute. It's important, though, with thyroiditis, inflammation, uh, um, autoimmune, all autoimmune comes from oral infections. Oh, okay. So the teeth, the gums, the sinuses, and the tonsils. Yep. In one way or another, Effect. with your thyroid gland draining all the garbage in your mouth, it's like it's like a... It's like a toxin screen for everything that's in your mouth. Okay, so get your mouth cleaned up, get your uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide, get your teeth looked at, all of that sort of stuff. Um, yes. When we're going to our dentist, who isn't Hal Huggins, <laughs> what are we asking them to look for, apart from amalgam fillings being removed? That's an obvious one. But say, well, like, I've got root canals. Have I got an issue there, you know? What are we looking for? Is it something that they've put into it? I haven't read Dr. Huggins' book. Oh, the... Well, first of all, 100% of root canals are infected. 
Okay. They're all infected. Okay. Shit. Because they take out the nerve and the blood supply. So there's no way the body can keep the tooth sterile up there. That's just not a possibility. And this has been documented with toxicological studies and over a 5,000 consecutive extractive root canals oh, that Dr. Haley and Dr. Boyd Haley and Dr. Huggins did. Now, if your thyroid status is perfect, if your supplementation is perfect, if your CRP is perfect, well below one, like below 0.5. Wow. Yep. That's uh, low. And, uh, an interval change shows that the level of infection in your root canal is not changing. They can be of inconsequential impact on your health, but that's a really small percentage. So, okay. okay. And we're talking about a perfect reverse T3, T3 ratio. Yep. Because when that gets out of balance, infections metastasize just like cancer metastasizes. Oh, wow. The title of my book, Hidden Epidemic, the subtitle is Silent Oral Infections Cause Most Heart Attacks and Breast Cancers. Crikey. Okay. okay. Yeah, so it's that so important. You, should, you, you send, me a, send me an email, I'll, I'll send you the ebook on that. Oh, uh, brilliant. Because what you need is a 3D cone beam examination of the mouth because many times even other, other teeth can be infected but do not hurt. Wow. Yeah. That, that's got me really concerned because I've got a really, um, you know, I've got a whole lot of um, implants too. In, in, in the, in the well, that, that's, that's where the, the 3D would be important too, because it could tell you whether the implants are stable or infected. Okay. Wow. So people, um, Hidden Epidemic, get that book as well. You've got a lot of reading to do after this episode. Dr. Thomas Levy, you've been absolutely amazing. I really just thank you and honor you for your work, the passion you bring, the compassion that you bring. Uh, it, it's phenomenal. And I just wish there were more people like you on the planet. So thank you so, so much for, for everything. You've today. got a lot of passion in this too. So <laughs> yeah, I do. We're, we're, doing, we're doing it together. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll put out, I'll put my two seats in too, to hey. make a difference in this world. Um, and hopefully we can make it a better place for people. Um, so if people want to reach out to, to Dr. Levy, uh, his website and his uh, email, we'll put in the show notes. The website is peakenergy.com. Go and get those books, Curing the Incurable, uh, The Magnesium Reversing Disease, Death by Calcium, Primal Panacea, uh, The Toxic Tooth. Um, there's so many. There's 11. I can't say them. You probably can't <laughs> say them. Um, <laughs> go and get some of them. Start reading. Start learning. Start educating yourself and take responsibility for your health. Any last words, Dr. Levy? Well, we touched upon it earlier, but just that people realize, and it's difficult, I know, when you're sick, you're frightened, you don't want to be thinking a lot, you just want to put yourself in the hands of somebody and let them take off with it. All I can say is that's a mistake. Yeah. You, you, got, you got to collect yourself, deal with your emotions, talk to some family and good friends, start your own research track, and be the captain of your health care. Love it. And that is everything that I believe in and stand for in a nutshell. Take as much control as you can, even if you're not a doctor, even if you don't have a background. We have access through things like this podcast to get the best information and be proactive in your health. Be preventative, not the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. And if you are in the deep trouble, Make sure you are vigilant. Make sure you ask the questions. And if you get pushed back from the doctors, find another doctor if you can. Okay, Dr. Levy, thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely amazing. Very good. Thank you for having me, Lisa. Take care.